beautiful. Well, if you have your Bibles, open to Colossians chapter 1 tonight. Colossians chapter 1, thank you for being here. We can continue our series in the book of Colossians. If you missed this morning, I brought a sling to church this morning and thankfully did not kill anybody. Uh, that was my main goal in using that, was not destroying someone's life and my, my time here as a pastor. Tonight, I only brought my Bible. All right, that's a good thing to bring to church, so isn't it? Your Bible. Whether it's here or on your phone, I don't mind. I don't fuss at you either way. Uh, we live in a time and a day that we have more access to the Word of God than any other time period in human history. Right, this right here is my preaching Bible. I had another preaching Bible, but for my birthday, someone got me this preaching Bible. And now my other preaching Bible sits in my office on top of my other preaching Bible. Right, that other preaching Bible is the one that Pastor Olet gave me when he transitioned. Not to be confused with the other Bibles that I have inside my, my study back behind my office. At home, I have my devotion Bible, which is a new Bible for this year, by my other devotion Bible that I used before. I can also use my phone where I have an app installed and, or my iPad or my computer. We have no excuse. We have no excuse for not knowing, studying, and loving the Word of God in this time period. We have access to it all of the time if we so desire it. But sometimes we just don't desire it. Sometimes you rather flip your phone open to the news, to social media, or to the text messages rather than the very message from the Word of God. We'll go tonight to Colossians chapter 1, verse, that was just free, by the way, it's not my sermon tonight, by the way, just a, just a side note right there. Though it would be a good sermon now, wouldn't it? And look at that. Colossians chapter 1, continue our series on, on the study, and tonight I'm entitled the message, The Power of the Gospel. Before you disengage, before you click out, those of you who've been saved for a long time, you say, wait a second, I know the gospel, and uh, this is nice, it's wonderful. Paul, to the Colossians, the church of Colossae, brings back the power of the gospel. Remember, this was a church that was struggling with some error in their understanding and in their influences. This is a church that was saved, there's no doubt about that, these were Christians. Maybe a younger church, we're not sure of the exact age of the church, but obviously in that time period, it wasn't 50 years old. But they were saved, and Paul has talked about already in the chapter, the first chapter of Colossians 1, about how they've been a testimony, that he's heard of it. Others have seen of their testimony of the gospel and what has happened, their love one for another, and their testimony to other people. So not only was it a saved church, uh, they were separated, and, and they were serving church. Others could see what was going on. This wasn't a bad church. This wasn't a church where, boy, it's just filled with, with horrible things. But there were some issues in the church, some teaching that had crept in that was, um, that was misguiding, all right, and causing some of the Christians at Colossae to go down a path that wasn't right. And Paul begins to bring some truth, some ideas, and some concepts back to this church to get them right back where they're supposed to be. Now what's interesting about this is we get to chapter 2 and, and really end of chapter 2 where Paul will deal a little bit with the false teaching. Paul throughout the book does not deal as much with the false teaching as he does with the truth. Knowing the truth will keep us from error. I could do a series on cults and other religions and you would find it relatively interesting and intriguing. I did a little bit of it when I taught about the church. I don't spend a lot of time on that because I don't need you to know what every other religion knows. I need you to know about Jesus Christ. And I get that not because it's my idea, because that's exactly what Paul does in Colossians. And here in Colossians chapter 1, we're looking at verse 13 and 14 tonight. Paul takes us back. To the one thing that separates us from every other religion, and if I can, every other false religion, and that is the gospel. The gospel makes us different than everything else. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Remember the theme of Colossians, I submit to you, is Jesus Christ. Over and over, Paul will emphasize the different facets of Jesus Christ. 
his power, his sanctifying promises, the truth that he brings, the reactions that we're all supposed to have because of Jesus Christ. Tonight, as we look at the power of the gospel, I want to encourage our hearts. There are three thoughts about the power of the gospel before we look at the, the scripture here. Remembering the gospel, focusing on the gospel, will cause things to be revealed. By knowing the gospel, you'll be able to interpret truth and error. Even not having known the error, by knowing the gospel, by knowing Jesus Christ, you will know and you will have some guidance of what truth is. The gospel helps reveal. Not only does, does the gospel help reveal, the gospel helps remind. Reminds us that at the end of the day, we are just sinners, but we are saved by grace. That is a good reminder. Wherefore, let him that stand, I think if he stand, take heed lest he fall. We get to thinking that we're all right. We may not think that we're just really good, but we think we're all right. I'm doing all right. Look, I'm, I'm here on a Sunday night, and some people aren't. Careful. Careful. The gospel reminds me, reminds you that we're just sinners, but we're saved by grace. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We're all sinners. I'm just a saved sinner, washed and sanctified. The gospel reveals, the gospel reminds, and the gospel will rouse. It'll wake us up and cause us to witness. If you believe in the gospel, if you truly believe in the power of God in a life, you will tell someone else. No doubt about it. You cannot love the gospel and believe fully in the gospel and not want to share it with someone else. The issue is that there are Christians who believe more fully in a brand of truck than they do the gospel. They will influence other people to buy a certain type of pickup. This will be a really good purchase for you. It'll really help your life. It'll run well for you. And I don't mind that influence and that wisdom. I'm okay with that. But please, but please, don't put more stock in the brand of your pickup than you do in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we do that, we've missed it. We have missed it. The gospel is linked, linked to witnessing. The gospel is linked to being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. The gospel is linked to being a testimony for Jesus Christ. We are salt and light. We are salt and light. Light reveals, directs, and guides. Salt preserves and flavors. Salt is different. You don't confuse salt with very much. I made some cupcakes, and I put extra salt in them. You usually don't have to tell anybody, do you? They know. They know. I made some cupcakes, and I forgot the salt. Oh. Usually you know about salt, don't you? You don't, you don't taste two things and say, well, I wonder if this is salt or sugar. Right? You know. You know really quickly if this is salt or sugar. Salt is to be different. And the gospel reveals and reminds and rouses us to a response. Look, please, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, as we look at the power of the gospel... Paul has has mentioned to us in 11 and 12 how we've been strengthened. We've been fortified with his power, his might. We're supposed to, verse 12, give thanks. What happened in verse 13? Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood Even the forgiveness of sins. Christian, have you been saved tonight? Yes, Jesus to save you? 
And because of that, some things happen. Power of the gospel. Lord, I pray you'd help us tonight. Lord, help me as I speak that this would be clear and helpful. Lord, true to your word as we kind of unpack this passage. Lord, you promised your word would not return void. Lord, I pray that these next few moments our hearts would be centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, that we'd be challenged. We'd be encouraged. Lord, we'd be strengthened and we'd be convicted. Lord, we're so grateful. We are so grateful for what you've done for us. Lord, bless. We ask for your blessing during this service. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. In this passage, in these two verses, is, in these two verses, I see two or three concepts for us about the power of the gospel. Three concepts in these two verses about what the gospel has done for you and for me. And as we are reminded, as these things are revealed, I hope and my thought and my prayer is that, you, one, your heart would be encouraged tonight. And we walk out of here that you'd be encouraged as you're reminded of what the gospel has done for you and for me. And maybe you're saved just two weeks. Be encouraged by the gospel. Maybe you've been saved for 88 years. Maybe you've been saved for 100 years. It's fine. Be encouraged by the gospel. Be encouraged. Number two, I hope that tonight, not only you're encouraged, but that you're strengthened. That as you navigate this landscape of 2021, you're strengthened in the gospel. So that as you hear truth and error, you can make a good, wise decision and choice. The gospel encourages and strengthens us. And lastly, I hope tonight that you will be roused. That because of the gospel, you will go this week. All right, not just next week, not two weeks from now, but this week go, and you will share the gospel with somebody else. Wouldn't that be wonderful if Christians shared the gospel? Well, wouldn't that be wonderful? Remember, that's God's plan. Let's look at, let's look at this passage tonight. The first thing that that God brings to us in verse number 13 is a little phrase, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? The first word that I want to bring to our attention tonight and kind of encapsulate this phrase is that we are rescued. Because of the gospel, we are rescued. We had a different, a different master and now we have a new master. We had bondage, but God brought deliverance into your life and to my life. That doesn't mean that some days we still won't struggle with the flesh and with sin. But we now don't have to serve anyone else but Jesus Christ. We have the ability, we have the potential to serve God. We are rescued, rescued from the penalty of sin. We have had a lifeline thrown out to us. And if we have believed on Jesus Christ, he has grabbed us with that lifeline, his son Jesus Christ. And he will never, ever let us go. No one, no man, not you, not me, can be plucked out of the father's hand. I can't do it, and you can't do it. Once we're saved, we are eternally, to everlasting, we are saved. We cannot lose that salvation. If we could, we would be in a world of hurt. If we could lose it, none of us could maintain it. None of us are good enough. Well, I'll just get resaved. Well, the Bible doesn't talk about getting resaved. The Bible talks about getting saved a one time decision that has eternal, everlasting effects of that decision. We are rescued. Rescued, this word here, delivered, has the idea of rescue as from a superior force. This, that word delivered has the idea that there was a force that was controlling us that was greater than ourselves. But then an even greater force intervened and rescued us. So there we were like little lost children in bondage to a superior force over us. But God came in with a far superior force and rescued us. The comparison of us to the bondage of sin 
is a lot closer in comparison than God and his power to sin. As his superior force came in and rescued us, there's that song, Rescue the Perishing. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Fanny Crosby, a great hymn writer, penned the words uh, to that poem. In 1869 was the year she penned the words to that particular song, Rescue the Perishing. She was asked about that song and why she wrote that song and the history behind her, the, the thought behind that song or that poem. And she said it was written following a personal experience in New York City at a rescue mission. She went on to explain that she would go one night a week to talk to her words, her boys. And one night, while speaking to them, she kept having the thought that there was a boy who had wandered away from his mama and must be rescued that night. Or he would be eternally lost. She made a plea that night to each boy that was there. At the end of the service, one of the young men came forward and said, did you mean me, Miss Crosby? I promised my mother that I would meet her in heaven, but as I am now living, that will be impossible. And that night, Fanny Crosby prayed with that young man and led him to Jesus Christ. As the story goes, as they finished, he said, And now I'm ready to meet my mother in heaven, for I have found God. We are rescued. The word brought deliverance. Rescued from the penalty of sin, but rescued from the power of sin. He broke the chains of bondage. As the song goes, my chains are gone. I've been set free. We're rescued. The gospel brings a rescuing, a deliverance to us. In our house, we have a, a rescue cat. His name is Preston. We used to have two rescue cats, but one went missing last year. The rescue cat, when we got him, did not want to have any interaction with humans. In fact, they said that he would never interact with humans. Because of the time he had spent as a stray in an abandoned house in the city of Saginaw, they said he would always be feral and would never interact with humans. But my wife is a stubborn lady. I knew that before this sermon and before the cat, but it fits in here now. You know, my, and my wife determined that she would get this cat to like her. My wife's excellent with animals, with chickens, with cats, with dogs and ducks and geese and soon horses. My wife went on this mission. She would sit outside his cage and talk to this cat. Now, the reason we got these cats was simple. We had a mouse problem, a mice problem. And I said, I need some things that will take care of my mice problem. And this cat and his brother as well, uh, they, they do a great job. They really do a great job. Just on a side note, uh, they brought a bird tonight. He brought a bird in tonight. Birds, he's brought rabbits and uh, squirrels, moles, mice. You know, we used to have five children, now we have three. It's great, great cat. <laughs> Be careful, don't, don't come to my house, house at night. You'll be gone, I'll drag you in. This, look, I'll drag you in. And I remember the, or I remember in, in, in the time that with that cat, is one day when he just began to interact with Doreen, and he'd rub up on her leg. And now he is as if, if you came over and saw this cat named Preston, you would think he'd always been around human beings. We rescued him, and then it, he got changed. And they said it wasn't possible they said, he won't be different. But look at that, he is. You know what people say about Christians when they get saved? That's all right. You may have rescued them, but they won't be different. They won't be different. No matter what happens, they'll still be that same rotten old person. They'll still have, they'll still have those same rotten old attitudes. They'll still have those same addictions and problems. They won't be any different no matter what you do. They'll still be feral. <laughs> but Jesus gets involved. Jesus gets involved. He sits by that cage, right? He says, it's okay. I love you. Let me help you. Let me provide for you. Look, I'm giving you food today. I care about you. And even when you hiss at me, even when you get angry at me, I'm still sitting here. And I still want you to know that I care about you. 
So we're rescued from the power of sin. There's a wealthy and famous athlete years ago. He put it all aside, the story goes, to disappear into a mission field of China. And then he went to Africa. He was lost from sight for 13 years without contact. They made contact again. They asked him why. This was his response. Some people love to dwell near a church with choir and steeple bell, but I want to run a rescue station a yard away from the gates of hell. Listen, my friend, we've been rescued. We ought to run a rescue mission a yard away from the gate of hell. The Bible says that he has delivered us from the power of darkness, the next phrase there, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. The second word, the night, the first one was rescued, the second one is removed. He brought a translation, a difference. We're removed from one place to another. We've been translated from that power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. The idea is of a little child who is stuck in a crib and can't move on their own accord. And a mom or a dad has to reach down and pick them up and remove them from that crib and translate them somewhere else. Now the issue is we just think we can move all by ourselves. We think we're good at this, but we can't. And the Bible teaches us, the Bible reminds us that we're nothing but a small, helpless child in his sight. I'm glad to be his child. And he has removed us, all right, and translated us to the kingdom of his dear son. He has removed us from rejection, a place of rejection, to a place of acceptance. Before, we're in a place where God could have no part with us. And we could have no part with him. In fact, if someone is not saved, at the day of judgment, God will state, your name's not in the fountain of the book of life. Depart from me, I never knew you. A place of rejection. But once we are saved, once the power of the gospel is effective in our life, he has renewed, removed us from a place of rejection to a place of acceptance. That means that God accepts me. Sometimes people have what we call insecurity. They worry about if people will like them for who they are. We all have insecurities. Everyone has insecurities. And sometimes in, someone has a great insecurity about acceptance, they will try to portray a different attitude than what they really are. If they're playing sports, they will act like they've never lost a single game their whole life, and they'll tell stories about how they're always the hero. And they're trying to portray a place of acceptance when really inside they're afraid of rejection. I'm so thankful that we don't have to portray acceptance with God. God, when we're saved, removes us from that place of rejection and places us in a place of acceptance, translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Not only did we get removed from a place of rejection to acceptance, but he removed us from a place of penalty... We were in a time out box, if I can, a penalty box. We went right from a penalty, not to the game, but right to royalty. Once we are saved, once we become saved, we become joint heirs with Jesus Christ. He is royalty. And that makes you and I to be heirs of royalty. That's a big deal. Like, that's a big deal. He did not just say, oh, that's nice, I'm glad you're here. He said, listen, I'm going to give you a high standing. He did not just bring us in at the bottom level and say, earn your way up. You see if you can get any higher than level one. It's not like a video game. We start at the beginning, keep on hitting levels. No, no. He, he translated us, he removed us from a place of penalty to a place of royalty. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Not because of me. Not because I'm good or anything, but because of him. 
Now listen, that should cause me to live differently. If I has, have his name on me, if I'm representing royalty, if I'm representing royalty, then I ought to have a different pattern of speech because I'm part of royalty. I, I'm part of royalty, so I better carry myself differently. I, I better have some different reactions because I'm part of royalty now. There's now a responsibility because I've been translated, I've been removed from a place of penalty to a place of royalty. That means I can't just act the way I want to. I can't. I'm royalty now. It's not bragging rights. It's a weight to follow him. Responsibility. We've been given royalty because of Jesus Christ. The little phrase, the end of that phrase, he's translated us into the kingdom of his, those two little words, dear son. Just want to point this out to you very briefly. That word dear also just means loved. Loved son. Reminds me of John 3, 16, doesn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his dear son, his loved son. That word, though, is far greater than just, I loved this son. That word in the, in the Greek has the idea. And this made me chuckle when I was studying. That's why I bring it up, all right? It's not really pertinent to the point, but I want to bring it up. Has the idea of a love feast. A love feast. You say, what, Pastor Howell? Let me explain. You ever been to a buffet before, back before COVID-19? Been to a nice buffet? A few years back, went with some friends down to an all-you-can-eat seafood buffet. As many crab legs as you could gorge yourself on. They had other things there as well. Useless things that you didn't need to eat, like vegetables and potatoes and things like that. I'm sure they were going to be good that night, but I went for the crab, the crab legs. My wife was with me. My wife's from New Jersey, near the shore. My wife loves the seafood. And my wife loves to eat. I'm surprised they did not kick us out of that seafood feast. Because we ate so many. And not me, I think my wife, I know my wife ate me. I don't remember how many, how did you remember how many crab legs you had that night? 92 crab legs. You say, how can that little thing eat 92 crab legs? It is a thing of beauty to watch. <laughs> and she's so... Lady, like when she eats it, <laughs> like that. <laughs> no, no. She. I tell you what, though. My, my <laughs> eating, eating crab legs. My wife will not leave a sliver of flesh, crab flesh, in those things. Picks through them. That's a feast of crab legs, is it not? God says of my son, I have a love feast on my son. In comparison, what he, and, and then beyond that, and then beyond that, God says. That he loves you and me. And he doesn't love in a small measure. So that when he removed us, when he translated us, it was because of his great love. <laughs> Think about that. Not just mediocre love, but a love feast on you and on me. Remember, we're royalty, right? We're supposed to be a little bit different. I told you it was just a side note, but it actually ties right back in. Because Paul says this. The reason that I live differently is because the love of Christ constrains me. Huh. I don't do it because I have to. I do it because of love. That verse, I believe, is purposely ambiguous. The love of Christ. It's hard to decipher whether it's his love towards me or my love towards him. In fact, the answer I like to give for that verse is yes. Yes. Why do I serve Jesus Christ? Whose love, mine or his? Yes. But my love will never match his love. He had a whole big love feast on you, a whole big love feast, love feast on me. The power of the gospel, the power of the gospel reminds me to be thankful. One more phrase in this verse, if you would. Verse number 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even 
the forgiveness of sins. You see, we were rescued, we were removed, and number three, we were released. We were set free. As in, as in, in this particular idea, the ransom, payment for a ransom. We were kidnapped, held against our will, kidnapped with no way to pay the ransom. Jesus Christ paid the ransom. Don't know if this story is true or not, but they say that we get the expression, a king's ransom, from Richard the Lionhearted. The story goes that in 1193, it's a long time ago, King Richard I, Richard Lionhearted, was leading a crusade to the Holy Land. As he returned through Europe, he was captured in Austria. And Leopold V demanded a ransom for Richard's release. The price was 150,000 marks or about three tons of silver. Enormous amount. But as the story goes, the people of England loved their king so much that they submitted to extra taxation. Many nobles donated their fortunes for Richard's release. And after many months, the money was raised and King Richard was returned to England. And that's where we get the expression, a king's ransom. I don't know if it's true or not. It's a nice story. I do know, though, that there's another king's ransom that was paid. The price was the death of a king, King Jesus. So not? The king's ransom was paid for me and for you. And for your next door neighbor. For your co-worker. For the gas station attendant. For the man who cuts you off on the road. For the lady who cheated you out of that deal. A ransom was paid. For the cousin who needs Jesus Christ. For the child. For the mom. For the grandparent. The ransom has been paid. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. I'm redeemed, what does the song say? By the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy his child and forever no man I am the song continues redeemed 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 by the blood of the lamb old saying something is only worth what someone will pay for it isn't that true these days they have these shows on TV, these fixer-upper shows, and they say, look, we found this, this old, whatever it is, dresser. People will pay a king's ransom for an old piece of junk. But it's just got history. Yeah, it's got history, all right. You just made history by paying for it. But I'm so glad that you and I can be ransomed. We can be redeemed. Remembering the gospel will reveal, reveal error and truth. Remembering the gospel will remind us to be grateful and to be thankful. And remembering the gospel ought to rouse us to witness. Tonight, if you're saved, then the gospel of Jesus Christ has touched you. So why don't you be different? Live differently, different perspective, and tell people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Share the good news. The ransom that was paid. Be different. Have the correct response because of the gospel. It goes beyond life circumstance. It guys, it goes beyond your occupation. It goes beyond your financial situation. It's down to your soul. If you're saved, you're called to something. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the gospel. 
Lord, I pray that tonight you'd encourage our hearts. Or there may be those here who have been discouraged. Maybe because life seems to be tough. Lord, tonight would they be encouraged because of their salvation. Lord, I pray that tonight there are those who would be strengthened. Or there may be some who are struggling with thoughts of error from other influences. And Lord, I pray that tonight you would strengthen them. And Lord, then I pray tonight that we would be challenged to be a witness for you. Lord, that we would not, that we would not hide the great gospel of Jesus Christ, which we've been given. Lord, so much. Lord, may we not be more consumed with the thoughts of what pickup truck to buy than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, as you've touched our hearts, would you help us to respond the right way? Lord, I pray you'd help bless this invitation. May we be true to you. In Jesus' name.